Hello again, you sick, twisted weather freaks, and Merry Christmas. It's meteorologist DT from WX Risk with my Christmas Eve This Week in Weather broadcast. I'm your host, DT from Weather Risk, and of course, I am the commander of chaos, criminal confusion, and I'm not Santa Claus. Okay? So, just let's get that right out. <coughs> I don't do Santa Claus. All right, in this edition of our This Week in Weather here, we'll be talking about the Sudden stratospheric warming, SSW, that doesn't mean south-southwest. Well, actually, that does, but in this case, it doesn't. And also, we'll be talking about the uh, polar vortex. And then we'll be talking about the interval December 31st to January 2nd or 3rd. That looks less wintry for the Mid-Atlantic region and more wintry for the northeast U.S., and by that I mean north of the Pennsylvania-Maryland border. And then we'll talk a little about mid-January and... Uh, you shift towards a colder, stormier pattern, but again, let's not jump the gun here. It takes a while for um, the uh, changes in the uh, polar vortex and the Arctic Oscillation to work down to the U.S., and it doesn't happen in 24 hours, so we'll get into that as well. All right, let's take a look here. Last seven days, it has been mild over most of the U.S., you can see, relative to normal, and it continues to run quite wet on the East Coast. That's, again... Not a surprise, given the pattern. All right, let's talk about this sudden stratospheric warming, what it is and what it isn't. This diagram shows you the two phases of the polar vortex. <clears throat> the image on the left is when the polar vortex is, is, is concentrated over the North Pole, where it's very strong and it's very deep. And if you look at one of these upper air maps, it's when you see lots of lines around it, it looks like a giant bullseye. That's when the polar vortex is very strong and very deep. And in doing so, it means the Arctic Oscillation is strongly positive. Now, the image on the right it shows you what happens when the polar vortex blows apart or splits into different sections. And this is when the Arctic Oscillation becomes negative. So right now, it's positive, And it's very tightly wound up over the North Pole. But there's a sign that that's going to change. Now, why does it change? Well, what happens is, we get these bubbles of warm air which move into the Arctic regions and they begin to alter the pattern and the conditions in and around the Arctic area. So this is an example of the upper air map for uh, at the very top of out, uh, the atmosphere, 10 millibars, almost at the edge of outer space. And you can see this is uh, valid here, the 24th. All right. <clears throat> now, uh, this shows you what it's going to look like on January to uh, 5th. So this is a projection of it. Now, this is the operational GFS. The other models are showing something different, but we'll get to that in just a second. So anyway, what happens is this is what it looks like at the top of the atmosphere. So that's a good diagram. But let's talk about what it looks like when the polar vortex is very strong. So when we have the polar vortex very strong, you can see it's situated right here. This is the vortex, okay, on the top of the North Pole. And what this means is that the Arctic Oscillation is strongly positive. It means the NAO by definition, is going to be strongly positive. It means the EPO is going to be strongly positive. And it means the PNA is probably going to be strongly positive. So these are all things you don't want to see when you have, um, when you want to get a snowstorm pattern. So these, that's why having the vortex locked in place over the North Pole is not a good thing, if you like winter weather. All right, slide seven. So this is the uh, positive phase of the Arctic Oscillation. Let me move this up a little bit. Now, this has a lot of information on it. So if you want to take a look at this image again, just stop the, the image, the video, and take a look at it. But as we can see, when the Arctic Oscillation is positive, that is to say, when we have this, the polar vortex is very strong, we can see certain important features here. Like, for example, um, a strong jet stream, overall polar vortex means lower pressure at high latitudes and higher pressure at lower latitudes. So as a result, the, the vortex does this. See that? And that's where the cold air is. And all doubt, this is all zonal air or Pacific air coming in. So there's no interaction. The jet stream doesn't come south. The Pacific jet dominates. And everybody's essentially dry and rather quiet, the pattern. And if we look at it more simplistically, there you go. There's your polar vortex. See that almost in the North Pole there. Very, very cold up there. Cold across central Canada, but nothing south of the U.S.-Canada border. And indeed, as you can see, as I pointed out earlier, that's exactly what we're seeing here. Notice how warm it is relative to normal. 
right? Okay, good. So that's what that's what the polar vortex. Uh, that's what it does when it's very strong and the Arctic oscillation is positive. That's the pattern. Okay. In addition, the Eastern Pacific oscillation is often uh, positive as well. And as you can see, what it does is it's over Alaska, and uh, it ends up overpowering the Pacific, the Western Canada Ridge here, with mild with Pacific air. So this gets destroyed. There's no flow of cold air into the U.S., and the Pacific air overruns the country. So that's what happens. That's, that's a positive Arctic oscillation. And then though this over here, this is the positive NEO. You have a big low here over um, Greenland. You can see that. And the 500 millibar, the jet stream area. See the big low here? Okay, all the cold air is trapped up in here. And again, you have mild Pacific air overrunning the country. And then also into Europe as well. It's all wrapped up into this. When the NEO here is... NEO is positive. Okay, good. All right, now let's take a look what happens when it splits apart. That's what we're looking for. That's what we want. The polar vortex to split apart. This, when this happens, by definition, it means that the um, Arctic Oscillation will either be negative or some, maybe even neutral. But usually it means it's negative. So, the, okay. So that's what we want. And, wh and we can see how that affects things. Now, what's happening is this gives us a temperature reading of a computer model forecast from the GFS, valid for December 27th. And you can see in the scale this enormous bubble of warm air which develops over the North Pole for a number of different reasons. And you can see, look at the orange and the black and the red here. That's this stuff up in here at the very, very top of the scale. A huge bubble of warm air gets pushed up into the North Pole, and that begins to alter the vortex and causes it to do certain things. Now, this is from... Um, Judah Cohen over at AER the other day, but he shows what happens very nicely. The upper image, upper left image is December 28th. And let me point out these features so you can see it quite nicely here. So here's our vortex. You can see it right there. Okay, and there's the bubble of warm air. Now by December 31st, look what happens. See how this thing is beginning to elongate like this? Okay, it's separating into two pieces. And there's your bubble of warm air. And then by <clears throat> January 6th or 7th, you actually have two separate pieces of the polar vortex and the ridges here. So now you have a totally different pattern. That's how it evolves. Okay, that's how the that's what the sudden stratospheric warming does. Now it doesn't always impact North America. Sometimes it can impact Europe or Russia. But ideally what it does is it forces the Arctic oscillation to go negative. There we go. We know what that does and sets up the trough over the Midwest and the East Coast. And you have high pressure over Greenland. We all we've seen that before. It allows the Eastern Pacific Oscillation to go negative, which means you now have a way of connecting from Siberia all the way into Alaska, Northwest Canada, and then in the U.S., as you can see right here, cross-polar flow. That's what we're talking about. So that's what you want to see. And, of course, then the NAO goes negative as well, which means that you get a southern storm track and winter storms on the East Coast and cold pattern, not just in the U.S., but also in Europe, as you can see. Now, if we look at the CFS and the G, excuse me, look at the GFS ensemble. Let me bring this map down. It's a little high here, this map. And you can see that this is, uh, this is yesterday's data, but you can see this is valid here for December 29th. Notice that we have this elongated vortex. You see what, how elongated it is? There's your bubble of rich warm air. But this is elongating. And so by the time we get to... Um, December 31st, look what happens. We have one center here and another center here. The vortex has now split completely. And now we're off to a different pattern completely. So that's what you want to see. Now, let's go to the medium range before we get to that, <clears throat> what it actually means. Okay, this here is the uh, 500 millibar pattern for uh, December 27th. And let me enlarge this a little bit so you can see more of it. Obviously, you have this huge uh, upper low right here okay and we have this big ridge over the eastern United States so the Arctic jet is doing this as you can see it's right along like this it's there's no way get there's no Arctic flow going into the US it's very cold up in here but it doesn't get it doesn't get into the US 
So this piece of energy is going to go in that direction. And that's going to set up a significant upper plains and upper Midwest storm. Now, eventually, what happened is the low goes up. You can see the near blizzard conditions in Nebraska, South Dakota, Minnesota. The low goes up into the Great Lakes, and the cold front arrives sometime on uh, the 28th or the 29th of some rain. Now, yesterday and the day before, the European model was showing something developing on the front after the cold front comes through. So we can see the temperatures. This is the temperatures on yesterday's European. Okay, so let me make sure we understand this. This is from the 23rd. Okay, this is the European model 12Z run. So we can see on December 29th, look at these warm temperatures. Now remember, you need to be at zero for snow. So there's your snow line. Okay, you have to be at zero degrees centigrade for snow. So Richmond is plus 12, DC is plus 10, Roanoke's plus 9. Okay, fine, we know it's warm. But look, by December 31st, the cold air has come, has pushed south to the Richmond, into Roanoke, Lynchburg, and you can see and so it's, that's potentially snow and ice for December 31st. Indeed, the European model does does snow a does show a North Carolina ice storm and a Virginia snowstorm up to D.C. This again, this is the 23rd, not really recent. This is yesterday's, and you can see what that looked like. I mean, wow! There you go. A repeat of what we saw for December 10th. But, 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 the upper atmosphere pattern does not support it. The AMJO does not support it. Again, I said this last week. Let me say it again very clearly i don't give a hoot in hell what the weather model says any weather model that shows an east coast winter storm when the teleconnections are this bad and the mjo is in phase four five or six should be ignored should be ignored now that being said look what happens on the mjo this is january 31st it does not get into phase eight until late january this is january 21 okay so the earliest is january 20th the phase seven is too bad. Maybe the January fifteenth. Maybe the fifteenth of January. Maybe on phase seven. But until then, no, not going to happen. Now let's take a look at the map so you can see. This is December thirtieth. The cold front is pushed on through. We have a short wave there over uh, Colorado and Texas. You can see it right here. See this piece of energy right here, and another bigger piece down in here. Now, here's a northern jet, but listen what the northern jet does. It comes down, you can see it here, like this, but it doesn't plunge southward. So all the cold air is still up in here. And what happens is, this piece of energy actually comes down. You can see, like, the, and the ridge gets bigger. See how the ridge increases a little bit here? It, see how it pushes up? So that's why it's not cold enough for snow on the 31st or the 1st. This, this unifies here, and we get a bigger ridge over the southeastern states. And we can see that clearly on the new maps here. This is the 12Z. Uh, this is the 24th. This is all 12Z data. Okay, on December 24. So, um, this is the European and the GFS parallel. Notice they have a little wave here developing right in here. Now, the GFS actually turns this into a snowstorm for New England. The US, for the Mid-Atlantic, it just goes off the coast. The cold air is not cold enough. And you can see what the GFS does. It develops a nice storm for New England and New York City, potentially. And there you go. December 31st. Pennsylvania, New York State, New Interior, New England snowstorm. Rain for Virginia, North Carolina, <coughs> Delaware, Maryland, Southern New Jersey, maybe Southern Pennsylvania. All right, this here is the um, European for uh, December 30th. And you can see again that um, there's cold air just to the north, but here's the precipitation right there. You can see it. Okay, so it's not quite in the cold air. It just isn't. Now, that could change, but again, we're not in the phase of the MJO, which favors snowstorms. Okay, so this here's the 31st. We just talked about that. We talked about how um, the short wave here, all right, and then this piece comes down here, which causes the ridge to form this way, and we warm up. So, and the load goes up the Ohio Valley. You can clearly see that. And you can see it here. Here's the 850. Okay, so we have our big Midwest low. Instead of going to North Carolina, it's here over Ohio. Now, a lot of cold air behind it. Meanwhile, we're getting warm air ahead of it. <coughs> Excuse me. So, that's December 31st, January 1st. And you can see what the models do with it. They take the low. Um, uh, the one here, the bottom is the European. I believe it's the European. Let me take a look, see here. Uh, no, these are both the GFS parallel. So 
the one on the left is valid January 1st the one on the upper right is the night of January 1st and you can see the low right here and then it's right here in West Virginia of course so that's rain for everybody in the East Coast but that's right that's rain for everybody there you go And again, like I said, any weather model which has an East Coast event in phase when the MJO is in phase four or five or six is bullshit. Should be ignored. Now, longer term, again, we talked about how the MJO gets into phase seven by mid-January. And we can see this experimental MJO here from Kyle McRitchie. He has the MJO GIF. You can see January 6th going into phase uh, seven and then January uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th into phase eight. What that means is this is, Feb this is phase seven. And you can see this is not bad here. Uh, you can see we have a lot of blocking. Here, a huge ridge here. We have a negative NAO, Eastern Pacific Oscillation. And the mean trough is it's like this. So this would imply low pressure areas doing that sort of thing. That's a really good pattern for the East Coast and especially Mid-Atlantic region, Tennessee Valley, that sort of thing. That's not bad. And then this is phase one. This is phase eight, excuse me. Uh, in January with El Nino. And this is, has more of a more Midwest track than not much so much in the East Coast. And if we look at the uh, European extended, this is day 10 and day uh, 13. You can see the trough gets very deep, a lot of cold air coming into the U.S. after January 2nd. The cold air does come back. There it is, January 4th. Very cold conditions coming into the U.S. from the eastern Canada. Now, <clears throat> looking longer range, the CFS weekly uh, 1521 day is this is a clusterfuck so we'll just ignore it I mean completely this is just ridiculous it makes no sense at all um, so I'm just going to ignore it in fact the uh, new version this is a different version of the uh, CFS 11 and 15 day look what it has here it's got a piece of energy in the southern jet stream like this see that and you can see the blocking going from Canada to Greenland all the way to eastern Canada much stronger blocking here so this southern piece of energy implies a potential snowstorm track for the east coast on after or around January 6th or 7th. But it's just potential at this point. There's nothing to get too excited about. And if we look at it individually, here we go. You can see the southern energy on uh, December, uh, excuse me, January 5th. Right there, see it? That's the piece of energy here. Notice that the northern jet is very strong, like we saw with December uh, 10th, coming in this way, bringing the cold air in. So the northern branch comes in, it does not phase, and this goes like this. So this would be a lower middle Atlantic snowstorm again, if this is correct. I don't know if it's correct. I'm just saying if it is correct. Longer term, the CFS does have the pattern getting very cold and quite stormy after January 20th. Big ridge on the West Coast, negative NAO, negative green Arctic Oscillation, big trough on the East Coast. And the European Weekly is also pretty bullish. This is January 8th, and that kind of supports uh, this a little bit. So there's some maybe agreeing with that. It's January 8th. And then this year is uh, January uh, 14th or 15th, and then January uh, 22nd, 23rd, 24th. So all in all, pretty stormy pattern, but we have to wait until the MGO changes get into phase seven. That's not going to be until after January 10th. So don't get too excited about it. Don't jump the gun. Uh, we have to wait and see how things play out here. This is meteorologist DT from Weather Risk. I'll talk to you soon.